Uh, my name is Andrew Bailey. I'm the Associate Dean for the College of Arts here at the University of Guelph. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to this talk in the third annual round of University of Bremen, University of Guelph lectures. This uh, instance featuring uh, Dr. Norman Ziroka of the University of Bremen. In just a couple of moments, I'm going to turn things over to Professor Donald Bruce, uh, former Dean of the College of Arts at Guelph and University of Bremen Research Ambassador, to say a couple of words about the Guelph-Bremen partnership and to introduce our esteemed speaker. Just a little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, Professor Zirocco will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we should have another 40 minutes or so of time for a uh, free-ranging discussion and questions. Uh, could I please ask you to keep your camera and microphone turned off for the duration of Professor Zaroka's talk, just to, to reduce uh, distraction for the attendees? And then for the question period, things will work most smoothly, we think, if you could please indicate in the Zoom chat window that you've got a question, and then wait for Professor Bruce, who'll be moderating the question period, to call on you. At that point, you can, of course, turn on your microphone and your camera and ask your question or make your comment. Also, if you prefer, you could uh, type out your question in the chat window once we get to the, to the discussion period and Professor Bruce will read your question out for Professor Zeroka when he has the opportunity. Okay, so I hope that's all clear. And without any more ado, um, uh, Don, could I invite you please to jump in and introduce our esteemed speaker? Okay, um, hello everybody. Wherever you may be, or um, whatever time zone you may find yourself in, uh, welcome to our uh, University of Bremen, University of Guelph lecture. Uh, as Andrew said, my name is Donald Bruce, and the role that I'm playing here is as research ambassador for the University of Bremen. Now, uh, that simply means that uh, it's my job to promote the links between the University of Bremen and the University of Guelph. For going on almost a decade now, University of Guelph and University of Bremen have cultivated relationship that has included faculty members, students, and staff. Over the years, uh, many of us have traveled back and forth between the universities um, in order to strengthen that relationship and to develop it in many ways. Some of those ways have been student re, uh, exchanges, uh, graduate students studying in the different universities, and then also um, promoting research projects and institutional best practices. One of the projects we put in place about four years ago was to set up a, a set of annual lectures between the two universities. So these would happen on a regular basis. And the way we set it up was that the colleagues would come from Bremen and do the lecture here in Guelph in September usually or early October. And then we would go to Bremen and we would do that there in May. Now, uh, our planning was all set to do that again this year uh, when the world changed around this. And so since international travel is off the table uh, for now, we thought we would do what um, we're doing with our classes and everything else, we go online. And so here we are. And it's my pleasure then to uh, introduce our guest speaker today. And that is uh, Professor Norman Zioka from the University of Bremen. I'll give you a little background on um, his areas of expertise. Uh, professor Zeroka is a full professor of uh, theoretical philosophy at the University of Bremen. And he has two doctorates. Uh, first, he did in physics and mathematics at the University of Heidelberg. And then he moved on from there. And the ETH in Zurich did a doctorate and then habilitation um, in philosophy. He was at the ETH um, in Zurich from 2004 to 19. And amongst other things, his researcher and uh, professor was a managing director of the Turing Center there in Zurich. Uh, an emphasis of his work is certainly on interdisciplinary research and interdisciplinary courses. And that fits in very well with the topic of his presentation today. He is also the author of several books on uh, physics and on philosophy in both um, English and German. Now, some of you might remember that back in the 17th century, the French uh, philosopher René Descartes said quite famously, that uh, le bon sens est la chose du monde la mieux partagée. In other words, common sense, reasonableness, maybe even critical thinking is the most shared thing in the world. Uh, he probably said that on a very optimistic day because if he had been watching the uh, debate uh, of the American presidential candidates last night, he might have wanted to revise that. Critical thinking is certainly something which uh, we spend a lot of time teaching our students. 
and it's um, sometimes in sad uh, in in uh, in short supply in the world in which we live. So I think it's very apropos and very timely that uh, uh, Professor Zihoka's uh, presentation today should be on critical thinking in research and education. So having said that, I will pass it over to him now and let him start his presentation. Uh, welcome to our guests, to our international uh, forum here today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Don, for this very kind introduction and for this great opportunity to give this year's Guelph Bremen Lecture. So I will now share my presentation, which, as you heard, will last for about uh, 45 minutes, but or and it will not be technical, so I won't presuppose any philosophical knowledge nor any knowledge in, I don't know, quantum mechanics or molecular biology or something. Um, because we have a very broad audience and because the topic is so broad, I thought uh, I would talk about things in one way or another most of us have maybe encountered and experienced, but it's still, I think, worthwhile to uh, talk about it in a kind of a condensed, maybe uh, concise manner. So what I will do now is start talking about uh, what I mean by critical thinking. So I will talk about um, how or to what extent we usually do this in our everyday routine, where there are limits. I will talk about the relation of uh, critical thinking to terms or notions such as responsibility and appropriateness. And then it will become a bit more philosophical. I will say something about uh, the fact that concepts also in science and research change, that we have conceptual dynamics, changing perspectives, and what in that context might be the role of philosophy. So a bit of uh, self-justification at that point. This part will last for about half an hour. And then the, the rest of the talk, so about a quarter of an hour will be about uh, teaching formats. Um, so ways I try to facilitate certain critical abilities by teaching courses which are to a um, particular extent uh, interactive and interdisciplinary as Don was already mentioning. And the um, article you see at the top right, so this is something I wrote together with colleagues from the chemistry uh, department back in, in Zurich, and this is more or less also the, the way I will talk about things um, today. Okay, so um, one further, um, uh, I should say one more thing at the beginning. So this talk is, a, is about facilitating a certain awareness, right? To, to not to present you now with a closed theory of what critical thinking is and uh, the one and only way it should be done. You will see in a minute why that wouldn't really work, but to kind of make you aware of certain things. So the, the upshot of the talk is, is more like, well, if you have a proper dia diagnosis, then that's half of the cure, rather than providing you with some uh, tailor-made or ready-to-hand concrete solutions to concrete problems. Okay, so critical thinking. I mean, a lot might come to, to mind here, and I just Googled it and um, found several, uh, you will find trillions and zillions of, of pictures. One, there are some uh, images which me being a philosopher, which make me nervous right from the beginning. So build your brain with critical thinking. I mean, there I get nervous because it's not so clear to me whether, <clears throat> sorry, whether it's my brain, that, who, whatever, does the thinking or whether it's rather my mind or something. So I won't talk about that. Uh, the, second, uh, the second thing is that there is something, it seems, uh, about critical thinking and light bulbs. So you definitely have come across that one. Um, I would say a bit about that on my next slide. And then there was an, um, an image which looks a bit more surreal, but I, I like it very much, and I hope it will become clear during the talk why. And that is this one, critical thinking, be prepared for what's ahead. And I think this is a, a good characterization of what I'm interested in. So be prepared for what's ahead. But of course, the point is that you don't know what's ahead, right? And as in this case here, ahead on the road, there might be something you wouldn't expect 
uh, normally, namely a fork in this instance. Okay, so um, of course, critical thinking, you might say, is something we we do all the time. And to some extent, this is of course um, true, but let me be a bit more, more specific. Um, so first thing, um, or some comment I, you, you might come across is, is to say, well, I mean, critical thinking is just problem solving, right? And I would say, yeah, sometimes it is, but surely not always. And I think that's especially this context where this kind of light bulb story comes in. So this is again, something I found on the internet, it says critical th thinking, you start with the problem, then you do the thinking, and then you have a solution, right? And then the solution, this uh, kind of enlightening moment is then, um, um, yeah, drawn or um, shown, in, indicated by a light bulb, right? Um, but of course, you might ask yourself, well, I mean, the headline of this, um, of this cartoon-like uh, image says, says critical thinking, but at the bottom uh, line, you, you only find thinking, right? And it's not so clear why this thinking should be critical or what is meant by, by critical in that context, right? So is it just problem solving? Sometimes it is, but that doesn't always seem to be the, the case. And then there's a, an interesting question about whether this is true or to what extent this might be true uh, for different disciplines in science or in, a, in the context of a university, you might think that, for example, engineering might be related to solving problems more often than, for example, the, the humanities, right? And the differences between different disciplines will be uh, important for this talk or for what I take critical thinking to, to mean or what kind of ability it um, involves that you are aware of um, different settings, maybe different disciplines where things work differently, right? So you might wonder, I just put up some arbitrary names from different, different areas here. You might wonder about Darwin, about Marie Curie. You might wonder about Kant, you know, famous um, German philosopher uh, who wrote a huge volume on the critique of pure reason, but what kind of problem did the critique of pure reason solve? Or did Marie Curie and the discovery of radioactivity, did that solve a so problem or Darwinian evolutionist theory? That doesn't seem to be, uh, let's say, the most convincing um, description of what's going on there. So let me try something else. So um, it's trivial or it's kind of our everyday routine in the sense that research is always about acquiring and questioning things rather than taking them at face value, right? Um, to some extent, this is of course true, but then we come up with certain constraints, which are not necessarily as uh, obvious and as strong as uh, the uh, debate last night with uh, Biden and, and Trump, but there are constraints. Um, and things uh, happening. So I have a cartoon here, you're completely free to carry out whatever research you want, so long as you come up, or uh, so long as you come to these conclusions. So of course, in our daily practice, we have numerous constraints in research. There are economic needs, right? There are funding and time limits. You cannot come up with, an, say, an experiment which takes arbitrarily long or is arbitrarily expensive. Then there's peer pressure. If your colleagues don't believe in your methods, it's hard would be hard for you to get uh, funding. Um, and there are ethical concerns, right? Okay, and so this may discourage the efforts to, to critically access your methods or the concepts you presuppose and the conclusions you draw, right? There will be some influence uh, on that. Um, and there are influences which are maybe a little more subtle especially regarding the, the use of language, the way you, you speak about your research area, about your methods. Um, and I will say more about that um, later on. But now let me be a bit more um, constructive in a sense, say a bit more about the term critical. Um, so I take critical to mean the opposition to um, being dogmatic. So uh, to, to be critical, I take take it to mean that you're not simply adhering to the to a fixed set of methods or concepts or exemplars um, and that you have the ability to view things from a distance and from different angles and as we philosophers tend 
tend to do and tend to enjoy. We always look at, at the words, where they come from, at the etymology. And so the, the Greek term krisis actually means decision and choice and uh, power of distinguishing. And uh, what's important here is especially the, the last of these three um, the, uh, translations or suggestions for translation, namely that's a power of distinguishing, right? That's about a power, about an ability. It's not so much the, an actual choice, but also the, the ability to make a decision. And we will come to that, why that is important, that it, it's an ability in a second. Um, okay, so why then is critical thinking needed? And now it's again interesting to talk to people from different disciplines to see um, what they are thinking of and what are these different aspects of critical thinking. So a standard answer if I talk to with people from the computer science, for example, is that they would say, well, we need critical thinking because of too much information, right? And completely straightforward, completely rational answer. Part of it is, uh, is due to the fact that what co people from computer science are often thinking of are thing, things such as um, re um, search results on the internet, right? Imagine typing in critical thinking into, into Google, you get trillions and zillions of hits, but then you want to be critical, right? You want to make decisions. You want to have a power of distinguishing what are the most relevant ones, which ones aren't that relevant. So there's too much information, too many hits, and we want to, to reduce this, right? Complete straightforward answer. But interestingly enough, if I talk to colleagues from philosophy, so from my own discipline, you usually get the exact opposite as an answer, right? So why do we need critical thinking? Well, because we have too little information. Often people, you know, they are just living in their kind of silo, just digging deeper and deeper. And they, and then you have these phrases like, they don't see the greater whole, they never think out of the box. And this is really something why we need critical thinking, right? Again, a valid answer for a certain context, but as with all these answers, maybe not for, for uh, not in all cases, right? And again, I have a have a cartoon for that. So there might be different answers to the question why we need critical thinking, but we need it, and it has something to do with uh, ability to distinguish things. And um, it's an ability, a power. So I put another term here, critical awareness. If you if you like that, the term awareness in order to, to make it clearer that we're talking about an ability. And why do I emphasize this? Because critical thinking, it's an ability or a power you might use at some point, but not always. Not always, please don't always question everything all the time, right? That would be skepticism and that's not something I'm, I'm um, interested in and not, nothing I think you can really live out, right? So as an illustration here, so um, if you are a skeptic, you might say something like, oh, no, yeah, I've seen such red plates and usually they, they've been hot and whenever I put my, my hand on, a, on such a plate, I, I burned myself, but actually I'm a skeptic. I don't think that that's necessarily true this time. I don't believe in induction. So, um, uh, I, I, I don't take it for granted that this uh, plate is, is hot, right? Um, I mean, you might say that, you might say that if you're sitting in your kind of academic armchair, and, but would you really be willing to, to, uh, to test it, right? Would you really be willing to put your hand on that plate, right? Uh, I suppose you, you won't. And so critical thinking is not about, in this sense, being uh, skeptic or being um, nitpicky. Right, so it's in between, or as I put it here, institutionalized nitpicking. Yeah, it's not about always saying, "Oh, I don't believe it. I don't believe it." Yeah, that might be different, but it's also not the opposite. And here I put a phrase which um, some of you, I don't know whether they're natural scientists, physicists, so uh, kind of standard quote in, in quantum mechanics um, lectures when for the first time students encounter all these these problems is with the concepts and get more and more confused. Then your instructor instructor might just say, well, shut up and calculate. So, and this is also, I guess, not a good thing to do. So it's in between institutionalized nitpicking and uh, shut up and calculate. Okay, so what's the, what's the flip side of it? So 
it's not only about you yourself asking questions, but it's also your ability to, to answer questions, right? And this, I think it's a good characterization of uh, what criti critical thinking is about, namely to be able to just justify what you're doing, to justify your terminology, to justify your research question. Why is it that you are investigating something? Why do you think that your research is important? Why this experimental setup? What are the goals, the limits, and the dangers, right? You should be able to answer that, those kind of questions. And now I think we come to uh, interesting, uh, also philosophical, broader philosophical terms. Namely, if you can do that, if you can answer those questions, you have a certain ability, namely a response ability, right? A response ability in the most elementary sense. And if you know, think, well, but that's just, you know, a play on words and that's what philosophers typically do. Well, um, I think there's really a point to it. And um, just to say that it works not only in English, it works, for example, also in German, where we don't, where we have a different etymology for, for responsibility. But again, in German, it's called fair Antwortung. So the response Antwort is again in there. So that's, that's really a point to it, right? So it's an ability to step back and answer queries in a reliable or better maybe understandable fashion. Um, and of course, if you do that, uh, you have to do that on many levels usually. Um, as a student, as a uh, professor, as an alumni, whatever the, the position you are, um, you are in. So, um, if you think of a university context, so there might be people inside your department, people outside your department, people inside your institute, outside your institute. And to show responsibility means to um, answer the same kind of question in different ways because people know more or less about your methods, about your concepts, right? And um, I thought I might um, illustrate that a little bit. So it's the, the challenge there is to be understandable, right? To be understandable if a colleague asks you, someone from outside academia asks you. And I take it that the challenge there is to kind of, as I put it, navigate the Bermuda Triangle, uh, which consists of the three points called triviality, incomprehensibleness, and falsehood. So to illustrate that, I mean, if I was to tell you something about, from philosophy about transcendental idealism or in, in physics about the behavior of quarks or something, I mean, it would be easy to talk in a, in a, in a technical jargon, right? So I would definitely be safe, so to speak, but I would be at this th south corner of the Bermuda Triangle that would be incomprehensible to most of the people, right? So what you then try, usually try is to simplify things, right? Okay, so um, maybe I should make it easier. So um, let's talk about the interaction of quarks just as if they were billiard balls hitting each other, right? But now the problem is that I sail too much, as it were, to the, uh, to the west, to Miami, and I, uh, things become, or my, my sentences become wrong, right? It's simply not true that the hit of two billiard balls is the same as an interaction between quarks. Okay, so again, I might move on further to the northeast. And just to be safe, then I might come up with a claim such as, oh, well, you know, uh, huge ch chunks of matter are somehow composed out of smaller parts, right? Then I would be safe. That would be kind of a, a, a valid uh, statement, but it would be trivial, right? You would think, well, but that's not much of information there. So the, the tricky thing here is to avoid uh, these corners and to somehow come out with a description which is neither trivial nor wrong nor incomprehensible. Right. Again, I'm not providing you with, uh, I can't provide you with the detailed answer, answer what that means for your discipline, right? But as I said, it's more about being aware of the um, general mechanisms and issues that are involved here uh, when you try to show your responsibility. So, so responsibility really consists in, in um, in being appropriate, right? Appropriate to a certain context, to a certain audience or something. And because only if you're appropriate, if, if you are understandable to someone, you appear as a reliable um, 
person and a trustworthy uh, warrantor in that context. Uh, okay, and so critical thinking is not so much about being right on providing the correct solution. And it would rarely be the case uh, in scientific research um, that there is a clear cut answer, this is the only uh, right method. Right? There might be methods or concepts which are more or less appropriate. So again, I have a cartoon here. You might think, well, but usually it's not a good thing to, to crack a nut with a, with a hammer. Usually it's not an appropriate way. Yeah, in many, you're right, in many contexts it isn't. It isn't. But of course, there might be contexts where it is helpful and it's surely not a, that it's the right or the wrong method. And now I turn to a bit more uh, philosophical point, namely that these questions about appropriateness and that it's not so much about being right, uh, that is not only because of different audiences you might encounter in your academic or, uh, or your, yeah, your, your life, where, wherever you are working. Or, and so, the, the other thing is that, of course, concepts, methods, and standards themselves, they vary. They develop and change over time, right? And this is true for all kinds of research, be it in the um, humanities, be it in, in the natural sciences. So I have uh, some examples here. So if you engage in research, right, you have, you, you have to talk about the, the, the items, the objects you're interested in. You want to theorize, maybe you want to measure if it's an empirical context. Um, and then you need some way of talking and this wouldn't be innocent, innocent in the sense that this will have um, an influence on the way you think and on the way your whole area of research develops. And I have two examples from physics and then one from biomedical sciences. So you know that I guess back from a school day, so atomic physics, beginning of the 20th century, there was the idea that, oh, maybe an atom is a bit like a, uh, like a planetary system. And yeah, to some extent it is, and to some extent this was, was a helpful analogy, but it also, of course, hindered research, right? And it's important to be aware of these things, that we are talking in our research, we are talking a certain way, and the way we talk will surely influence what we are doing, what we are able to see, what we are able to, uh, uh, to, uh, to understand in a certain sense. I have another example from physics, which is maybe more um, telling and historically more interesting, that's electrodynamics. So in the 19th century, people were trying to figure out, okay, so what, what's the relation and what is all this about with this electric phenomena and magnetic phenomena and things like that. And of of course, they were thinking in terms of analogies. They were thinking in terms of things they, they would know about, and that would be uh, mechanics and hydrodynamics. So, and that's the illustration on the right. So you might think about an electric circuit in analogy to water circ circulation, right? There's pressure, the water pressure is somehow analogous to the voltage. And you, so you see that the tubes here get, get small and it says resistance. Um, in this uh, illustration, and this is somehow similar to what's happening in an electric sur uh, circuit with uh, uh, resistance. Um, but of course, to some extent, this really facilitated the understanding of these phenomena, these analogies. But on the other hand, they also uh, hindered a lot of de developments, right? And I have a uh, third example, as I said, from the biomedical sciences, cancer research, for example. It's cancer research is full of warfare metaphors, right? Cancer basically is your enemy and you have drug targets and you have killer cells and so on and so forth. And you get illustrations on the internet, like the one I, I put here at the bottom. Um, and of course, it's not to say that that is, is wrong, but of course, it, it shapes your research. And if you think about cancer, as your enemy and as something you have to, to fight, then your strategies for curing cancer, they will go in a certain direction. And if you start to talk about cancer in a different way, so for example, for a couple of years now, maybe a decade or something, there's more talk in terms of a milieu um, 
then of course this changes your research strategies, right? Those, so then the analogy is more with the milieu and social change rather than with uh, warfare. And again, the point is not to say that something is right or wrong. It, the point is to be aware that that is the way science works. That's the way normally your research works, right? You talk about things in a certain way, but that very fact makes, or that means that you are able to see certain things or context quite clear, clearly, but other things you might not see as clearly. Right? And um, since Don was mentioning uh, beforehand to me that there's a course uh, where some of you are enrolled and that engages in the question of what is science. So this is also an interesting thing. So is there such a thing as a unique criterion for for science. So is there a cr criterion where you might say, okay, if this criterion is fulfilled, it's definitely science. If that criterion isn't fulfilled, it's definitely not science. Right? Um, I will come to a course um, I'm, I taught with the guys from pharmaceutical science um, in, a, in a minute, but I will already mention an experience from that context. So that course also started with the question, so what is science? And if you talk to, to, to students from uh, pharmaceutical science. So it always turned out that they would say, well, um, of course there's such a criterion and that's empirical. It has to be empirical, otherwise it's just speculation, I don't know, theology or something, but definitely no, no science at all. Right? And as soon as students come up with that answer, I usually then ask back the, the question, okay, so what do you th uh, think about the mathematics department then. I mean, hardly anyone is doing empirical research in the mathematics department. So shall we close it down because it's not science? And then they would go like, oh, mm, maybe not. And then you might come up with a whole list of criteria um, of what makes science, science. And then again, you will see that there is no such, no really clear cut answer in terms of right, and, and wrong. And I put some other things here. So empirical might be difficult to say that science is always about in, induction. Mm, that's maybe too loose because I guess tea leaf reading is also an inductive practice. It's based on past experience and you have clear cut rules, I guess, for, uh, for what to read out of your tea leaf uh, next time. Mathematization is maybe true for certain parts of physics, but not for evolutionary biology or other areas. Um, reproducibility is also a tricky thing. Um, for example, in physics, cosmology, Big Bang theory is not so much about reproduction, or at least not straightforwardly, um, and things like that. So again, the point is to be aware of the fact that we have various um, criteria here, all sensible, but in different contexts to different extents. So I would suggest that the ability to critically uh, think about things is based on a certain amount of historical and philosophical uh, knowledge, right? And the point is because you are part of the game if you are a researcher. So the um, negative insight, and then put it into some philosophical jargon here, the pessimistic matter induction from past falsity, so the, the point here is just to say, of course, we might be laughing at or about the people in the 19th century who, you know, try to understand electrodynamics in terms of mechanical analogs and I don't know about shear waves and, and stuff like that. Uh, but of course, we should be aware of the fact that it's very, very, very likely that we are in a similar position with uh, respect to our research topics at the moment. That again, in a in hundred years, people might say, oh, wow, in those days, ha, 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 people was, were thinking such and such, right? It's fair enough, it's part of the game, but you should be aware of that. And what's of course the positive thing here is that if you're aware, you might gain a certain kind of research toolbox for uh, looking at things from different angles. So you, you might increase your awareness that, uh, the, the, or to have a look at the, the powers, the limitations of your approach, of the fact that there are alternative approaches, metaphors, maybe changing metaphors, maybe start talking, talking about milieus instead of targets, and you will see that, okay, it helps in that uh, case, but isn't really helpful in the other case. Um, okay, so 
Okay, more or less half an hour is um, over. And so it's just one more slide for this um, first part. And that's just the question what a philosopher can, can do or a philosopher of science in particular. And I just wanted to share with you um, uh, a quote I like very much from the mathematician and philosopher Whitehead who said that the overall aim or the purpose of doing philosophy is to coordinate the current expressions of human experience. And so this is made in a very broad sense that you know you have experience not only in an academic context but you're also um, uh, have experience in a political context, you're a citizen, maybe you have your religious experience and so on and so forth and his idea is that philosophy is of getting these things uh, in relation and understanding how they might, may relate to one another. And in relation to research, you might, of course, then say, well, but there's already a similar um, exercise, a similar aim um, we should try to, to hit, um, namely by doing interdisciplinary reflections on methods and, and concepts. And I think that here uh, philosophers might play an interesting role and then you might end up, as in, as in my case, for example, as I already mentioned, you might start by writing white papers together with colleagues from chemistry, for example, about uh, why responsibility is such an important thing and where, it, where the term comes from and what's the most elementary sense of showing responsibility. You might, this is another example, might think about the role of, so more uh, contemporary thing, you might think about the role of um, artificial intelligence in certain uh, experimental contexts and things like that. Okay, but now let's let's move on to, to the examples from, from teaching. So why would you try to teach this kind of critical thinking? Well, of course, we want students to be responsible, to become responsible. And of course, as mentioned on, on the last but one slide, if you gain a toolbox or if students gain a toolbox, they are better prepared for contingencies. So think again of the fork on the road and actually it can be can be fun right and then you learn something interesting and which is fun and you don't end up like with this cartoon here like um, uh, students from chemistry being asked what they learned at the end of their studies and most of them say well i learned how to draw hexagons right so that's maybe not what we want so when do you start teaching um critical thinking I would suggest early on because if it's an ability and an awareness, then it's something ongoing and something accompanying your studies, right? And it's not, I guess, the right idea to say, well, first learn your discipline, learn all you have to know, and then afterwards start the thinking. Um, but again, we can leave that for the for the Q and A. It's again interesting to see that there are differences between disciplines, um, what people think, and of course, you might think that there's kind of an inherent problem. I mean, how to teach teach someone to be or not to be uh, dogmatic. Okay, so I have, um, for example, that want to mention only very briefly. And the first is a course I taught with, uh, in the, in, together with the physics guys, uh, philosophical reflections on physics. Then uh, a course, I already mentioned it, with uh, people from pharmaceutical sciences called scientific concepts and methods. Then there was an interesting course together with people from architecture on digital methods and architecture. And I will mention that not so much because of the, the content of the course, because, but because of a tool, an online whiteboard we used and uh, which was already fun and great thing to use even before Corona, but now um, it's um, actually even more helpful given that we have so much online and remote. Um, education at the moment. And the last one is a uh, brief mention, a course on research data management and data science, which is just in preparation at the moment in, in Bremen. I should add that the first three courses I will be mentioning, I taught those courses back in Zurich. As Don was mentioning, I only um, moved to Bremen about a year ago. Of course, I use all these teaching elements, also my courses in, in Bremen, but it was easier for me to now present it in that fashion. To, to give the, the main point away right from the beginning. The most important features, I mean, the interdisciplinarity is of course a great thing, um, but then it's interactivity and then wherever possible, try to work with, with, with the students' own work, right? Make students think critically about their own work, 
right? Or that might also be the suggestion for, for students. Also think about, step back and look at your own work, what you are doing when you do a research project. So the first course I would like to mention the physics people. I know that you cannot read the details on the bottom left, uh, but it's yeah, for those who are interested, there's more about the, the details of the course and the exact setting. So the idea there was that we talk with students um, about key concepts in physics. So for example, what's the role of, the, of an experiment in physics? So what about the notion of causality? What about theories and models and metaphors? And what we, we did there and we is, um, so the top picture you, um, uh, you see on, on the left, that's Rainer, a proper physicist. And then on, uh, on the left, it's Rainer, yeah, proper physicist. On the right, you s just see his back, that's uh, Michael, a proper philosopher. And then it's me somehow in between. And what we did is with each of these topics, we, um, uh, we thought about different positions beforehand. So three very different positions, which would be different from one, one another in more than one respect. Um, and each one of us was defending one of those positions. And actually, this was a stage debate. So we um, uh, arranged that beforehand and we were not necessarily defending our own positions. In fact, this was kind of tricky for the students. I was a bit astonished about that. Um, and then we had this stage debate saying, one is saying, oh, the um, experiments are important for that reason. The other one saying, no, it's, they play a very different role. That's really what they are about. And then the third one. And then we started with a, a panel discussion. Then we had the students vote. So that's the next picture you see. So they could then vote for option one, two or three, what they like most. And then you see that some people don't agree with any of those positions. That's why you see a four, a number four. Um, and then we, we turned it into a, um, uh, a plenary discussion together with the students and afterwards we had breakout groups which in those days before corona was kind of a logistic effort which is now of course with zoom and teams much easier to do um, and they then had to defend their position so it was about responsibility about taking a stance and then during the turn of or the course of the semester you could of course then um, increase um, the, the the level of difficulty then we asked people about what position they like most and find most convincing but then immediately afterwards ask them okay you get another five minutes but then you have to defend not that position but uh, one of the other ones and, and things like that so we can come back to that in the q a let me just mention the other courses so with the pharmaceutical sciences that was very nice because it was for the first time that we uh, turned a, a critical thinking course into a compulsory course so now uh, students there really have to take that course. There we had inputs from from uh, philosophy and then also from science. So for example, what's the role of an image? And then, so that was my in, uh, input. And then we had a, a guy from biomedical imaging uh, um, presenting some of, of the methods involved there. And then we had a non-staged uh, uh, discussion um, with the students about these topics. And then students had to reflect what they were taught in relation to their own project work. So students in the semester beforehand, they did a small research project. And now each and every topic we discussed during the course, they then had the, um, um, the, the assignment or the exercise to apply it to their own work. So how were images relevant in, in my project? So what was the role of, of data in, in my project? And students really like that right they so we had very enthusiastic feedback especially about this reflection on their own work okay so um then with the course with the with the architects that started with a certain conceptual idea in the background namely that together with the colleague from architecture we thought well it would be great to teach a course together where we discuss concepts which are important in architecture and also in philosophy so for example a notion like process so uh, architects are obsessed with processes and we also have that we have a certain branch in philosophy called process philosophy so and other notions as well and then the issue was okay but philosophers are used to write texts right whereas architects often i mean they have really 3d models and they they a lot of their discussions based on images on drafts 
and how can we combine that and maybe reflect what's going on here with these different uh, backgrounds so reflect and experience knowledge generation as i put it here so we came up with the idea well we should actually have everyone on the same page and maybe everyone and everything on the same digital page so course preparation execution documentation assignments yeah minutes of the last meeting students reviewing each other's work everything done on on the same digital page so we had a, um, a project there then together with the web designer where we created an online whiteboard and so here you have snapshots from this course what happened is was really interesting to see how people were working with images and with text, how you could literally see how arguments were pushed aside. There are text box now moving to a different place in that field. And that was great fun. And of course, that was before Corona. And I now come back to, to using that tool more often. And I'm very happy that by now we also have a Bremen instance of that, of that whiteboard. And together with my colleague from architecture, that's, so that's Hannes, um, we wrote a paper where we documented all the the, the teaching method we used. Okay, and so I'm moving towards the end. The, the fourth example I want to mention is a course which is in preparation in Bremen at the moment on research data management and data science. And what I think is really fantastic about that co uh, course is that so many people from different areas are involved, right? So there are very different disciplines who are interested in data management. So we have the Bremen Research Alliance, which is not only about the university, so that would be the UB, so the first abbreviation in the brackets here, but it's also the guys from and girls from the Polar Research Institute, so the AWI, the Alfred Wegener Institute, people from the Research Center for Artificial Intelligence, um, people from the German Space Agency, from uh, the Leibniz Research Center for Epidemiology, they all are engaging with data with a lot of data and with managing those data. And now the idea is to have a course for graduate students of various disciplines and to, to uh, yeah, teach them, to discuss with them the role of data in these different areas. Again, I know that you cannot really read what's going on here. Um, but anyway, the, the idea is we now start with the starter track and I'm very happy that people not only learn about, you know, basics of statistics and uh, of um, computer science, but that we also have a session on, on critical thinking and digital ethics in that context. So with that, I come to, to the end and I think it's, yeah, 45 minutes now. Um, so just to summarize, I think that critical thinking is not about a body of dead and nitpicky textbooks knowledge. I don't know whether you can read it on the right, it says Libri a peso. So that means books by weight. So critical thinking is not about reading, 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 becoming a know-it-all and then annoying everyone with your, I don't know, with your quotes or something, right? And by the way, if you need a warrantor for that, um, I suggest Heraclitus. Um, the learning of many things does not teach understanding, right? couldn't stop myself from uh, that one. Um, but it's a way of engaging with the world around us, right? Uh, put it more emphatically, yeah, emphatically here. Um, the world around us, what I mean is, is the, the practice in your lab but, or, or your, your research context, but of course also the, the um, discussion with the, with the wider audience. And just to repeat that, so what's, what are the values? There's an intrinsic value of becoming or being a responsible researcher, right? A responsible researcher. And the instrumental val uh, value is of course gaining the, as I call it, toolbox, right? It's not about having a palatable re re ready to hand solution for the next problem you will encounter in your research. No one can do that. But it's about being flexible, systematic in your thinking, and maybe then less surprised when encountering something unexpected and also realizing the historical contingencies of your own present position and with these um, with the unexpected things we are back with the with the um, fork on the road and that's it from my side looking for the forward to the Q&A session and thanks for your attention Norman thank you that uh, certainly uh, struck a lot of uh, common chords for me and uh, the work that I do in my classes with uh, my students. 
Um, let's take a look and see what we've got in our chat here for questions. And there's one there already. And, oh, they're popping in. And uh, so this is Olaf Schultz. Um, and this is a comment on understandable and applicable. W would you like to uh, open up your mic or your camera and uh, yes. pose your question? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Norman, for the wonderful talk. Just uh, one sentence to my person. I'm an old student of the University of Bremen, so invited as alumni, and thanks for this opportunity to uh, have it in internet so I can join. A second, I'm working for a, a European agency giving policy advice, and therefore I was uh, fascinated by your uh, discussion why my research is important and um, I wanted to give a comment mainly because you were mainly going to uh, if the research is understandable so if you can explain the research and I think from my point it's at least equally important that the research is applicable and that the researcher really comes to an application to the position where they have to bring their research to something which is useful for the society. And unfortunately, I'm a policy advisor. I recognize a lot of research, which is highly rated in journals. But when it comes to the application on a real question, it's more or less useless. Because as you said, it deeps in in a very specific question but unfortunately, this is not the question of the problems we have to solve. And I could give a lot of examples, but I stop here. And um, I would suggest uh, that you put in your list of critical thinking as one criteria, not only as understandable, but applicability. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your, for your comment. Um, um, yeah, I guess we, we, we uh, agree on that. I might also just... Uh, add something on that that um, of course I think we want science to uh, to lead to to applications but of course it's uh, the the way from from starting your research to the application is the, so to speak the difference at uh, the distance is is uh, depending on the discipline sometimes it's shorter sometimes it's it's longer right so um, uh, I mean it would also be not be sensible to I mean we have the corona crisis and we want to investigate there and we want to have something uh, some some drugs some uh, vaccination we want to we want to use but it would also be of course stupid to now stop uh, all the other research areas right and um, and um, the, the applicability is not always immediately um, um, visible, right? So that is also something we, we I guess, we have to, uh, to keep in mind. But I guess, in, in, yeah, in the end, we agree. We want something to, uh, um, yeah, something which, which kind of, in, in, how to put it, improves mankind or something, right? I guess. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, to move on, the next question, whoops, next question here. This is from uh, Dominic Lange. Um, and Dominic, if you want to jump in on this, um, you can. What role does critical thinking play in questioning the structures of the science and research itself? So, for example, the dependence on funding agencies or that men are more likely to become professors than women? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, um, that's, of course, True, I started talking about critical thinking in the context of, of research, but of course, to be um, critical uh, within a university or within our research context, that of course should also um, um, be something to uh, we have to do in the context of, yeah, maybe of, of administration, of, of funding. Um, let, me, let me provide you with the uh, maybe with a bit of an, an anecdote, but which I think is, is maybe a good example in this context. So for ex thinking about funding, right? So um, usually we have funding agencies and then we, we all write these reports and then, you know, there are a lot of, let's say we have 100 applications and the, in the end three uh, projects get the funding and now we have 10 projects which are really good, right? 
And normally we now start to, you know, do some kind of micro analysis within the, 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 the report. So maybe this one is a little better than that one or maybe, but I, uh, to be honest, that's not really rational, right? And um, I came across a procedure which I then really much liked with the, with, that was back in Switzerland with the funding agency who then said, well, if we have 10 really decent projects, then perhaps it's more rational and it's in a sense fairer if we then uh, um, uh, take those um, uh, 10 um, um, and the projects which are really good and then we you know throw them all in in a bowl and then you know pick pick three out right and not not trying to to uh, do some weird analysis why why one project is more more sensible than another one so all in all these respects or all these um, uh, contexts i guess it's it's also important to to be critical. So what mechanisms are really sensible in that context and which ones um, are not? Right. Okay. okay, I'm gonna jump over for a second into the uh, hands up. Carmela, you have your hand up. If you'd like to unmute uh, and uh, or put on your camera. There we go. Uh, hi, um, my name is Carmela, as my professor said. Um, so my question uh, for you is, what made you so interested in this whole studying about critical thinking? Like, what, what drew you to it and exploring this topic in different fields of research? Um, so so what got me, my, got me in there, what I find most interesting, Interesting. Or why? Why I do this? Or yeah. Oops. Okay. Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think I'm. I'm. Maybe then that's because of my background. I mean, being trained in in two disciplines is it was always interesting for me to see that different disciplines work differently, right? So if you say what's what's a good exp explanation, for example, in in physics, then that really works different. Um, you, you can't really translate that one to one in a different uh, into a different discipline, and uh, so I was always fascinated by by that. And so to to learn about different disciplines and to know how how they are working, and then of course you realize they all do it for good reasons, right? I mean, it's it's rational why they why those guys and girls work that way, and why people in other di disciplines don't work that way. And I think, or my feeling is that I learn a lot about. Um, about research and our interest in understanding the world, to put it more, more broadly, if I if I compare these things, so that's really something uh, that that interests me. And then, of course, it's it's interesting to see the differences, let's say, already between uh, students within the science. So that, for example, the physicists are very di different from the pharmaceutical scientists. And then again, to have something like like the architects, which again are working very very differently and um, yeah, I think this is really, it's, it's enjoyable. And of course, it also teaches you something. You learn something by realizing that there might be different ways of going about things. And maybe there are certain aspects you, you, you keep in mind and say, okay, maybe next time if I come across such and such an issue, I might uh, take over some of those ideas. Thank you for your response. Good, thank, thank you, Carmela. I'll take another one here from the, uh, from the chat. And this is from Graham Taylor. And this reads, we have 14 members of the machine learning research group here today. I noted that you co-authored a paper on AI and drug design. I've seen articles stressing the importance of critical thinking in the age of AI, but I'm curious if you believe that machines can think critically or is this something innate to humans? Okay, yeah. Um, now I have to give the... Uh, uh, first, I start with the kind of, I guess, notorious reply of the of the philosopher that, of course, then we have to to look at the terms. So, more exactly, what we mean by think critically and you know changing perspective and and, and things like that. Um, but to be a bit more con concrete, um, I think this is really an an interesting research question, and it's something I'm actually very interested in, and maybe we can think about doing a project on that together. So. Um, but let me g give you an example where I'm skeptical about whether this is really um, already um, 
critical or whether this is already like stepping back. So, so a colleague um, of mine back from, from, from Zurich did uh, use some neural networks in the context of um, astronomical data. So they they fed in some some observation observational data about planetary motions, and then uh, uh, quite quickly the uh, the neural network did a representation of the data within a helio heliocentric um, uh, worldview. Right. So the 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 neural network kind of reduced the number of parameters and, and then kind of figured out that, you know, heliocentric uh, worldview is, is um, let's say, more parsimonious than, than a geocentric, right? But then you might start wondering, is this really already critical or the other big term in that context is, of course, creativity, or is it just a different representation? After all, the data are st still the same. It's just just a different representation. But I think that's an interesting question. And there, of course, the, is the question where where does it start that we would say, no, but this is now really something original and th this was kind of, of critically ref re reflected. And um, yeah, maybe I leave it for that, but I'm, I'm, I'm just to uh, emphasize that again, I'm very interested in, in these kind of, of questions because I think it's it's tricky, it's interesting, and it's important to see when is there the level of something new or really uh, critical. Thanks a lot. I think evaluating it is really central to this conversation as well, right? How, how do we judge whether the machine's actually thinking critically? So that's a, a big open uh, question right now. So thanks. Yeah, thank you. Great. Okay, um, another question from the list. This is a short and pointed one from Julianne. How can critical thinking be taught to politicians? Yeah, thank you very much for taking my question. I would like to explain why I asked it. So I'm Juliane Filzer, Professor of Ecology at the University of Bremen. And our main research field is risk research for the environment. And over the years, I have become increasingly desperate concerning the outcome of what we did, there have been a little, uh, a few small improvements, but over the whole range. So just think of, uh, to take a very blunt example, global environmental change. Uh, we have known the problem already back uh, at the Club of Rome report, the first one. So why and why on earth now that we've had a chancellor who is a physicist, a doctor of physics, <laughs> why uh, didn't she react way earlier? <laughs> and how can we teach that? That's my question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, um, <laughs> I think it's, I mean, yeah, I, I definitely see your, see your point. I think it's a difficult uh, question. And I think one really the, the complication there is i guess with the with the fact that in in politics you really have to m make your decisions and they have immediate consequences and um it's maybe then a bit different from the from an academic context where in a sense um we can allow ourselves more to reflect about things so this is not not really to, to justify the politicians, but to maybe sh say something about wh where there is a difference, right? So, so they have clear cut kind of, kind of timelines. So when is the next meeting and when it's this and up to that point, we have to make a decision about that. Whereas in, in, in science, we, or, or in an academic context, um, we are not, let's say within the same game to some extent, right? And this, I guess, is one of the reasons why it makes it so difficult to, to, um, to do that. I mean, after all, I mean, if, if you're a politician, right, what would you do even if you know that, of course, there are these trade-offs and that trade-offs, and, and I know that in, in the end it's more complicated, but then, of course, you, you have to decide something, right? And which is of an immediate consequence for, for millions of people. So I also think it's a, to be fair, it's also a difficult job, right? I fully agree, but still uh, people don't act like they should do. So they, mm -hmm. could up, they could set up a few more regulations. And I really wonder if we have any tools to, to train them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
the really critical points, which are not only the next elections. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, kind of more of a, of a discourse maybe, right, for them to realize people from also talking to people from science, to people from different areas. Maybe it would work like, like with, the, with the previous question. So like something similar to the academic context where it's kind of interesting and helpful if we see, if we get students from different disciplines together. Maybe it's the same thing about politicians even getting them more together with, with scientists and more and not only uh, to be a bit sarcastic and not only with, with lobbyism from certain industry or something, right? So, yeah. yeah, good point. Thank you. Yeah. I'll just mention in that one, it's interesting because Germany, compared to many countries, is probably more forward-looking in terms of climate issues than a lot of the countries around the world, particularly our neighbor to the south, for example. And um, it's been interesting to see also in the framework of the pandemic, this clash between uh, the scientific thinking and the political thinking. And some countries have dealt with it better than others. Uh, okay, so we're going to uh, Asen, Asen uh, Ivanov, and the question here is, thank you for the fascinating talk. Could you please tell us more about your course on research data management and data science, and specifically on how you plan to teach critical thinking in the context of this course? What role uh, critical thinking plays in data management and data science training and education? So probably an elaboration on what you were talking about a moment ago. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so the um, yeah. Let, let's talk a bit of the setup of, of this course. So we will teach it for the first time now in the uh, winter semester. This time it will work like a like a seminar because we all have to 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 figure out what we are doing ourselves, and then it's meant to be uh, established as a as a as a standard course. Then so so much for the for the housekeeping background um, so and then as I said so over the course of the semester we will have single sessions on different topics so database management and some more details and statistics and so on and the critical thinking there uh, what I will do is actually to this leads back to one of the the question the one by by um, by Graham uh, actually it's about um, uh, creativity and the question about whether we can find out something new, really new, by or by means of um, of AI. That's that's one context. And um, um, in terms of the historical awareness, right? I, in my talk, I was saying, well, it's it's often it's important to see uh, how people were engaging in questions. What were well, kind of the the, the um, the, 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 the good things and the rather poor things. And I will do, for example, something similar in that course. I will give an input where I say something about, um, to make people aware of, of just of the fact of the, uh, of how old data science is, right? So some people might think that, oh, you know, everything changed. No, no, we have, we have data-based research and this is something very different from what we had in, in, in back in our history. We never had that, that before. And, of course, as I said, a, pure, uh, a proper diagnosis is part of the cure, it's half the cure. Something similar is, is, is true in that context, I think. So my, my beloved examples are the, the, the Babylonians who back in uh, antiquity or the archaic uh, period, they had data-based um, research. They had big data. They were writing down astronomical data for centuries, really for centuries, to then came up with very... Uh, for our um, understanding, very elementary algorithms which allowed them to say when there will be the next lunar uh, eclipses. And, and it's interesting to see that there has been data-based research already centuries, in fact, millennia ago. And, and to be critical then also might mean something like, well, if I look back into history, then the Babylonians were the, were the heroes in I don't know, 700, 800 BC. They were the only ones who, who were able to, to make astronomical predictions. But then, interestingly enough, um, the Greeks came at some point and they started to have geometrical models for 
planetary motions. And as soon as they started doing that, they suddenly became the, the heroes or the best ones in doing um, uh, astronomical predictions, right? And so this is, of course, something that might be interesting for us. If someone now says, well, you know, you know we have data and we can, we can work on data and we no more need theorizing um, because we can number crunch and that's all we need. But then you might say, well, but look back into history. We had these kind of changes already you know, centuries, millennia ago, and these things happen. And, and I think, again, it's important to make students aware of that and so um, to, to discuss so what's, what are aspects of our current situation which uh, are, in a sense, quite old, and we have come across that for, for quite some time, and how did people react in, in certain, uh, uh, under certain conditions uh, and, and in cer certain constellations. But then again, of course, there are elements which are very new for us at the moment and which maybe have not occurred in the, in the past. And again, it's, it's a question of kind of distinguish, distinguishing these things and um, to, um, yeah, to get an awareness of the, the concepts involved and, and on the history. I hope this somehow answers the question. Okay, and we've got another one here. This one's from Sam Liu. And uh, this says, would you say that censorship somehow dogs critical thinking? To narrow down this question, you said that critical thinking should be taught as early as possible, wherein a lot of censors block information to younger students, especially in the fields of religion, politics, racism, and so forth. Would you say that this position challenges the practice of critical thinking among younger students? The type of protection that's used to keep uh, certain types of information away from younger, younger people. Yeah. Um, I'm, maybe let me answer this question in a, in a, in a, in a, in the way that I'm not so much talking about religion and, 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 um, and racism, but there is a general point behind that. And maybe I can, can illustrate this in a, in a context, which is not as, 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 as difficult as um, yeah, religion and racism. Um, there's of course always a, a problem about being critical about something, right? Or if I use the term to, to, to do some reflection, right? To reflect something, right? You, there is something that, there must be something you, you, you can reflect on or that can be reflected. Um, and so in all contexts, we have the discussion of, of course, I have to know something or there has to be a body of knowledge and then I can start to, to, to think about it. But of course, the question is to what extent is that true, right? Um, do I really want something or to, to first do the, do the, the, the learning or do, you know, gain all your knowledge and then only at some certain point I'm allowed to, to do the reflection. So that would seem a bit weird to me, right? So, you know, first do your master's degree or whatever might be the analogs in a, in a, in a, in a religious context, right? And only then you are allowed to ask uh, uh, questions. I, I would think this is maybe the, the wrong way, but of course there is a problem about that you have to uh, to be at a certain level of knowledge in order to to reflect, right? No, I, I try to be rather diplomatic in my answer. I don't know whether that's uh, whether that's okay or maybe I'm not so clear about the question. I don't know. Any, any further comment on that, Sam? Okay. Um, so moving on then. Um, I'm not sure about the pronunciation here. This looks like a, 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 a Polish L here. So, Michal, maybe? Uh, and it says, uh, great talk, thank you. For me, critical thinking was always more about investigating, digging deeper, and asking questions about the topic under discussion, which may as well be a solitary activity. From your presentation, I got an impression that it's more about communicating your ideas clearly, discussions, uh, being able to collaborate with other people effectively. Can I ask you to expand on how, in your opinion, those two concepts contribute to critical thinking as a whole? Mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah, thank you. Um, of, of course, to, to dig deeper um, 
is also a way to, um, of course, uh, um, be critical, right, about your concepts and about your methods, right? So at the moment, I believe such and such, but can, can this really be the case? Or should I, should I be a bit more, uh, you know, take a bit more of that, a bit little less of, of that and and so on. So I think it, 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 um, it um, I think it doesn't contradict things. I mean, the, the point about being able to communicate is of course also a point about being clear to yourself, right? I mean, if you would say, if, if someone would say, well, I'm, I'm digging deeper, deeper and deeper and I get a better and better understanding by actually I'm not able to communicate it to anyone, um, that would seem weird a bit, right? So, I mean, then you would think, well, but then it's not even clear to himself or to herself if he cannot com uh, um, cannot kind of put it in whatever might be the, the proper way in your field, put it into words or put it into a mathematical formula, right? But if you dig deeper in the exact sciences, then you should be able to, to put this into a formalism. And of course, you should be able then, say, to, to produce a paper and then your colleagues should be able to, to read that. So I'm... Uh, I, I didn't mean to oppose to the idea of being critical about a, a method, say, or about a concept. Um, of course, digging deeper is also one direction of of, um, of uh, working around or figuring something out in, in, in the in the neighborhood, so to speak, of your of your concept of your method. Uh, that notion of the communication makes me think of the work of Naomi Oreskes, the historian of science, uh, because she, um, in her analysis of the different uh, modes of scientific inquiry, places a lot of emphasis on the communication dimension and the need to communicate between the, the scientific world and the non-scientific world. But sometimes it makes us feel a little bit like um, Sisyphus rolling that stone up the mountain and then inevitably it's going to roll down again, but we heroically go back and try to roll it back up, up the hill. We have a couple questions, yeah, uh, two more popping in here. Uh, for, oh, Juliana. Um, Juliana, do you want to come back about this? No. <laughs> oh. it, was, it was a read-only comment. <laughs> Oh, okay, uh, this was, uh, yeah, just okay. take Steve Hawken as an example. Steve Hawkins, yeah, he was digging very deeply, but he was also a great communicator. Indeed, that's very true. Um, yeah, and I think it's something we, we it's expected from uh, scientists and, and researchers more than, than it was like two or three decades ago or something like that. Very much, very much. Um, question from Klaus. Um, a question from a physicist. So the question may be silly. Does um, uh, critical thinking help with quantum mechanics? Quantum mechanics is a set of rules we cannot understand, but they work extremely well. I guess that's do the calculations part and can be well applied. What then is the role of critical thinking in relation to quantum mechanics, I guess? Mm -hmm. um, so, um... Let me start first in terms of, uh, maybe in terms of teaching, right? So, because I did that beforehand and I, I, I know that Klaus also gives um, or, or likes these, these questions and, and teaching courses on, on, in that context. So, um, again, to be aware of certain facts might, might help, right? So, um, if, if I'm teaching a course on, on the philosophy of quantum mechanics, we might discuss different interpretations, different understandings of, of quantum mechanics. And of course, for the students, it's the first time they encounter that. And they think, well, but it must work like that. And then they figure out, oh, okay, so there, that's maybe not a good interpretation, or there's this problem. And then you move on to the next interpretation. And again, there are certain aspects which you like very much, where you think, okay, this, is, this aspect is really convincing. But then there are other aspects to it which are not con convincing. But of course, I think in terms of education, it's very important to, to do that, right? To just say to your students, well, don't ask any questions. I think that's not not a not a good idea. I mean, even though if you yourself think I, I have good reasons for 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 saying that to my students, uh, because we have all these issues with all these interpretations, but I guess the students have to figure that that out them, themselves and really try to get their head around uh, the, those problems. So that is one thing, and 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 then of course if you are. If, if you are then still think, and I mean, people are debating interpretations of quantum mechanics, if you still think now I'm interested in a certain 
deterministic Bohmian interpretation for what reasons, <laughs> whatever. Well, um, but then it's good to, to, have, to have this this awareness and then you, you continue uh, uh, working on that. And I mean, you, the more you know about other um, uh, interpretations, the more that will help you for your own own research. So um, I would I would still think it's uh, it's a good thing to um, to do that to critically reflect about uh, even about something like quantum mechanics. Any further questions out there? I think we're coming close to the end. This has certainly been, um, I think, uh, very good for all of us. If there's anything we do as educators working in universities, it's to attempt to instill a notion of critical thinking in our students. And if we're lucky and it works, we see that they actually take that, that critical toolbox, as you've uh, described it, out into the world and use it in many different places. And I think uh, Juliana's um, uh, connection of this to the political realm is particularly important. And uh, we see in the pandemic situation, which we are in now, how those things do or do not go together um, in, the, in the public discussion and the extent to which um, uh, citizens uh, listen to the science and adhere to the rules or to the extent they do not. And they, re they reject it and go their own way with the consequences we see in, in some countries. So this, this is very much a, a living um, dimension for us. And there's one question that's popped up. I'll hop right over here uh, at the end here. We've got uh, time for another one, certainly. From Matthew, what aspects of critical thinking involve making connections? And could this be used to build trust, indeed trust, between those of different disciplines, example, politicians, environmental scientists? If so, how? Is there a specific method or process of communication that can facilitate its use? Okay. Um, because I think what he's trying to say here is certainly it's not just an information deficit. There's more to it than that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, what one would need is, of course, a, um, yeah. yeah, trust is a good term, right? So what are the reasons that we we trust in um, in someone. Um, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not so clear whether I have a, a have a direct answer to, to to that question. The thing I was just things that now came came to my mind is, uh, yeah, making making connections. I mean, this kind of. Uh, Um, okay, so what came to my mind is something I worked on in my um, PhD in, in philosophy, which was also about an interdisciplinary uh, connection between famous mathematician and a, a philosopher. And somehow, I mean, it, it seems to work in academia because we know of each other or we, ex we usually think that, you know, if I have a colleague in, in, the, in the mathematics department, he will surely know his math and, and the colleagues from the mathematics department might not know anything about, about philosophy, but somehow he would trust and say, okay, so Norman is the philosopher, so he would, he would know um, about philosophy. So there we have these kind, usually we have this kind of, of trust relations and there uh, the, the connections and the interdisciplinary work works. But of course the question is how do we uh, imp or what are the analogous mechanisms that could work on a uh, on a broader level without, say, turning into lobbyism or something? Right. Um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure about how to what what the answer is here. What what the mechanisms are? Sorry, uh, Juliana has proposed money. Uh, now yeah. that the cost for expected remediation measures become astronomic, people start changing their minds. Yes, you have people in their pocketbooks and they pay attention. And I would even point to, look at us right now in the uh, world of education. Um, in education, we've dragged our feet a long time about using the new technologies in order to communicate and, and work differently. 
not necessarily that we should all go online, but we can use these technologies usefully in flipped classrooms and hybrid teaching situations and things like that. It took a bit of a kick for us to actually plunge into this and learn to do it on a daily basis. Yeah. Any more comments? Give it just a second. Coming to the end here. <clears throat> okay, good. Well, um, I, I'll pass this over to Andrew in just a second. And um, I'd like to thank Norman Siroka for this discussion. I think this is something we all need. And it's great to see the uh, cooperation continuing between the University of Bremen and the University of Guelph. And for those who don't know, that's the city of Bremen in the background with the Vesa River right there flowing <laughs> beneath. And uh, for those who haven't gone there, go to Bremen. This is a beautiful city with lots of friendly people. And we've had a, a really great time building our relationship to our colleagues at the University of Bremen. So thank you again, uh, Norman, for your contribution today. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for all of you attending and for your questions and yeah maybe also in turn there might be some occasion where we might see each other in Guelph maybe at some point that would also be fantastic. Andrew? That would be great that would be excellent so yeah let me add my thanks to, to everybody else's uh, thanks so much Norman that was a really great talk and thank you to all the the audience members for those those really uh, energizing thought-provoking uh, questions for the discussion uh, Norman, I, I, I've really taken with the your uh, Bermuda Triangle model of understandability <laughs> that really speaks to me and also uh, the notion that your exhortation to the critical thinking that, that you are part of the game. I think that's that's an important thing to, to keep in mind. So uh, we're so pleased that, that you could all attend this talk. Um, it's really great to be able to connect this conversation in, across the Atlantic. Um, these are important issues, timely issues. Uh, just before we sign off, um, I just want to um, uh, give some thanks to the College of Arts staff members who were instrumental in putting this event together. I'd like to thank especially Chris Lee on the technical side um, and Danielle DeFuscher, Paul Forrest and Sandy Sabatini who, who worked very hard on the promotional side. Um, thank you, Don, for your, for your excellent moderation. That, that went very smoothly, I thought. And lastly, thank you once again, Professor Soroka, for, for your wonderful talk. It was, it was really um, thought-provoking and um, it was a great discussion. So thanks to everybody. Um, and I wish you all a great afternoon or a great evening, depending on your time zone. And, um, and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you.